So Thomas, first and first, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having us or having me this time. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time. Now, before we get into the music that you've been making, I would like to go back to the time just after college or university, because I believe that you and uh, Marcus uh, shared a house together for a while. Uh, what was that like? And what what would a normal evening of, of hanging out look like? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not sure everything is appropriate for <laughs> for recording, <laughs> but uh, no, it was good. I mean, I met Marcus while we were still in uni. I was I'm obviously from Norway, and Marcus lived in Sweden, and we met mm. through um, a common friend who lived in Copenhagen, which is pretty close to to where Marcus was living. And uh, we got invited over to a party, and uh, me and Marcus we just headed off straight away. And uh, you know, a couple of weeks later. Uh, you know, I came down to Sweden and we started working. And then, you know, um, a couple months later after that, again, I just decided to move down um, to Sweden. Um, in the start, we weren't really living together. We just lived in the same city and worked and stuff like that. And then, you know, um, Marcus just sort of needed an apartment. I had a spare room. He He's like, <laughs> you know, move in, you know. Uh, so we built a little studio um, that we were sitting in and we had like this big DJ booth in the living room. Um, we didn't really have any money. So the, we had a big living room, but it was like, like a couch, a TV and just the biggest DJ booth ever. <laughs> so we would like have parties and just play all the time. So I was usually like, everybody would just come hang out hang at our apartment and yeah it was a it was a great time um <laughs> quite different now but yeah it was good yeah <laughs> was i can really imagine fun. but if if you think back of that time did you move specifically to sweden to pursue music well was that kind of the idea and what's the connection that you had with marco was that immediately musical or was that uh, kind of just uh, as friends as well well, I didn't move to to Sweden for to become a musician, so to speak, because it okay. wasn't like this is, you know, quite a long time ago. So it wasn't right. really like it is now where everybody's sort of like a DJ or a couture. Sure. And it, it wasn't it wasn't like that. It wasn't it was very few people who actually made a living out of this, like proper living. So it's more mm -hmm. like a passion we had and it was a fun thing. Um, you know, coming out of uni, like my plan was just take a year off okay. and have fun in Sweden and make music <laughs> and just like do whatever. And, you know, we, we just hit it off, like both on the musical level uh, and also as a, as friends, we just became like, it was, it was this instant connection. And then, um, you know, making music and suddenly one day, you know, uh, Global Underground hit us up and wanted to do a single. And we were like, oh my God, <laughs> this is amazing. Let's do that. And it, it kind of was like one of these snowball things. And suddenly we're like, all right, we're making just enough money to pay rent and uh, <laughs> you know we're still young let's do it let's go for it and see see what happens yeah, and i believe so, some of the first singles then that ended up coming out was around 2007 2008 uh, uh, i think it was on oxygen but i might be uh, mistaken um so was that kind of the turning point then where you thought okay well this is going in the right direction this is this is something we can can make a living out of I think like it was never really an objective okay. to be fair, just to like make like to be become producers or DJ. Like okay. it wasn't really about that. We were just enjoying ourselves so much, and for some reason, people started paying us money to go to all these exotic <laughs> places, and people would sign our records. So we were like just living in it and thinking this was the greatest thing ever. Mm. And you know, obviously, as you you get a little bit older, and you know, there's more responsibilities. It was like, all right, maybe we need to become a little bit more professional in, in terms of setting up businesses and, and things like that. But, you know, at least for, I can't speak for Marcus, but for my sake, it was never, it took years and years until it become like, okay, this is what I want to do for a living. Okay. What was the initial kind of chemistry between you? Like, well, did you have kind of clearly defined roles? How did you work together on those early songs? I'm trying to try and think like I, I think for us it was just like we had s such a chemistry and like we kind of understood I because I could like hear like if Marcus sent me like an idea like a beat or something I could just like hear the next step and it was the mm. other way around too so if I had like this idea or melody idea I could send that to him and he would just 
I didn't even have to tell him what I was thinking. It would just kind of was a natural process. And I think still it's kind of like that. Okay. And, um, and, and the good thing is always like, we're, we kind of inspire and flow off each other. So if Marcus is having like a down period and he can't come up with anything, I might have like this really good idea flow and making just a lot of ideas and I'll just send it to him and he can sort of spin off that and the other way around. So it's been, it's been more of that. We don't really have these clear roles that I do this okay. thing and he does that thing. Um, but, but I would say though, um, <clears throat> Marcus is, is, is a, sort of a hardware wizard. Okay. I would say it's like, I call him just a doctor because he just can turn and twist and figure things out that is just, you know, uh, crazy to me sometimes. Um, so, so that's, that's, I think that's, and he, you know, he collects these things too. So he has like right. all the sense and all of this stuff. So it's cool. Yeah, just one thing I came across, uh, which is uh, kind of the, the MOOC. So, so, so what, what importance does the MOOC hold for the two of you? Oh, it's it's the big thing. We got the we got the matriarch now, and okay. it's just like <laughs> you know. But, but it, I don't know. Like it, it, it's all it's such a legendary sound, and sure. it's just the basics of everything. So for us, it's more getting the sonically. It just feels right. You mm. can't really explain it. It just feels right. So that's that's kind of where it is for us. Right. And now you went your separate uh, separate ways for uh, for a while. Obviously, I, I think you kept in touch and you still uh, remained good friends over that time. But was there a moment that you because I I know uh, Marcus was doing his Garden State thing and then uh, you were involved in that as well. So so how did you kind of how did that partnership kind of grow again to 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 where you are now? I think it's 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 a little bit about life. You kind of as you grow up, you kind of, it's not that you drift apart necessarily, but you get different sort of uh, things that are important at that point, or you have different ideas. So it has nothing to do about your relationship per se. Uh, it, it's priorities and stuff like that. Um, but me and Marcus has always had like these weird things, even though we were on our separate sort of courses in our solo careers, it was always still, I would work on some of his records and he mm -hmm. would work on my records and we wouldn't because it was never about like, Oh, I need credit for this or I need something like that. We were just doing things we thought were cool. Um, and when garden state first kind of popped out that idea, um, I was just in my period of time where I was like, I don't want to tour. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. You know, I get, I got, just got a kid and I was like, this, is, mm -hmm. I, I don't really want to do that, but I'm, I'm going to support you with whatever I can do. So just let me know what you need from me. I'll do that, but I'm not going to be part of the touring and I, I can't do that. So, so I was just working on the business side of things. I was helping out with that and like some music stuff and, and just being behind the scenes and I was really happy with that. And then, you know, over time it kind of evolves and I was so involved in the music for it. So I was kind of like, it started igniting this sort of idea that, you know, maybe, maybe I could do it. Maybe I could come back at one point. And, and when we started talking about the Anna May thing, it was more, this is what we wanted to do 15 years ago. And when mm -hmm. we started, this was the idea and now the timing is right. We got the resources, we got the connections, we have the music, we finally figured it out somehow. And let's, let's, let's go for it. And then it was more, okay, we had a studio session and the plan wasn't to make this idea, like this anime, it was just to make, start this new album or whatever it was. And right. it just clicked, right? So we were just like, holy shit, like this week and we just made all of these songs and it was like, I think we got to do it now. It has to be now. Um, and then it was now. And we just, we just went for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, and then the, this might be uh, you touched upon it already, but what what was kind of the what made it so that now was the right time? And then because you had that vision, as you mentioned, fifteen years ago, what made it that now it it kind of all clicked together? No, I think it's multiple things. Obviously, um, it everything starts sort of creatively. Like, okay, mm -hmm. how does this fit musically, and do we like actually able to make something? that fits what we're talking about that that's obviously the big thing um but 
there's more things to it. It's timing, you know, it is, you know, does it fit with your family? You know, mm-hmm. where do you want to live? Where do you, where are you in two years, three years? Because it's going to take a little bit of time to build it up to the way we want it to do. Sure. So are, are you ready to commit to that? And, but what sparked it was the studio session. It was okay. just like one of those things where we just, everything flo- flew out. Like we could, I, we felt like we could write an album in a week. It was just okay. incredible. So we, we wrote so much and, you know, we, you know, obviously we had those musical commitments with the Garden State project and everything like that. Um, and our label was invested in, in that project as well. So we obviously had to make some, <laughs> some phone calls <laughs> and, 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 you know, let them know, uh, like, this is what we really passionate about. We have this project now. I think this will be like, it's like the 2.0 version. Like this is the this is what you should invest in, and um, they were great. Uh, they loved it. Uh, they supported us, and you know we're we're really grateful for for our label. What was the vision musically? Because you say the time has to be right, and and especially with electronic music, I feel goes through so many stages throughout the years, and it, it changes very quickly. I feel so. What, yeah. what musically was the vision, especially after that studio session, or, we, or even before that, you thought, well, okay, this is what we want to do, and and this is how we are going to get there. Uh, musically, it, no, I think we touched based on it fairly early as well i think it's going to be well it is going to be wider uh mm. in terms of genre specifics we, we we been really careful to label anything because sure. we don't really believe in that you know i think it it you can call it whatever you want to call it that doesn't really matter to us it, it's just we don't want to get caught up in some sort of trend uh you know it, it's so easy these days like okay this is popular right. let's do that let's move to that and then usually what happens is that the label dictates these things like they say mm. okay this is what's making us money so maybe you should do more of that and push towards that and we've been lucky not to have that because we were really clear like we're gonna do this thing uh and it might some of the records might be m- more sort of streaming friendly popular more vocal based and then we might go and make a really hard underground techno record if that's what fits because I think it's going to be unique and and also it's kind of like when we play we want it to be really unique so we only Mm. play our own stuff like our own songs and that will vary and that's the theater of performing these days that's we feel lacking in some artists these days where it's kind of it's just like this very specific things and the songs start to kind of blend into each other and doesn't doesn't really give you anything and we want it to be up and down in tempo and energies and we want people to be engaged in it um so that's important and that's that's what we hope anime will be become and starting to be right now Right. Well, you mentioned something interesting, and I've noticed this, or I don't know if it's correct, but I have a sense that in in, uh, kind of pop music and other genres as well, it's a lot of things start to feel the same or start to sound the same. Is is it now easier, you think, or more difficult to separate yourself from the crowd? Uh, I think it's both, you know, because because mm. there is at the end of the day, there is a business side of things. too. Right. So you can you just like, well, there's nothing cool about like if nobody hears you, I want to listen to you. It's not, that's, that, that doesn't make anything cool. Um, mm. So there's this element of that that you need to sort of, OK, how do I interpret, you know, whatever modern music is into how I see it or how we see it. So I think that's the challenge. But I think it's it's easy today especially for younger um artists coming up because everything is so accessible so you can like if you want to make a rufus to Saul record you can mm-hmm. just like how do i make rufus to Saul? and there's a million tutorials and you'll get pretty close but you're missing the point right <laughs> so so i think i think you know that wasn't the case when we started because sure. you know obviously probably youtube wasn't around even it was an early start anyways and it was here's a sin i'll play with it and kind of see what happens um so i think yeah, i don't know it, it, it's a bit, bit of both it, it's easy in some sense because there's so much technology so you theoretically should be able to just be super creative and make something completely unique and on the other side it's harder because you know streaming and algorithms and all that 
Yeah, and as you mentioned, once something is successful, probably labels will push you towards kind of that that yeah. area. So, but yeah. th- th- it it must be great then that that when a song like uh, the best part comes out, that it's really well received because then then you kind of get that validation or co- confirmation that okay, we're going down the right direction in a way. Yeah, I think so. I think when we heard it the first time, like this is like three years ago, it was like, mm-hmm. a, that's an indie song, like an indie pop song. And we're like, okay, maybe we can make this electronic. And when we finished it, we like, this is going to be the biggest thing ever. Yeah. Uh, our label room like, no, this is not the biggest song. It will probably, okay. You know, like they were more like, mm, maybe we'll see. And in the start, the first six, seven months, it did okay, but it never really popped off. But suddenly that hit the right, time Mm. or moment or the right influencer or right whatever it hit it found its sort of place and then blew up and and it was like crazy because we didn't even when we said like this is the biggest song of the the album we were completely clear about that okay even even then it was like (laughs) (laughs) you know we never thought like 280 million views on you know like that was never like you know that's crazy (laughs) to us so but we we love it and you know been working with bn incredible band and and we've been working with them now so we have like a lot of songs with them okay so it's going to be interesting to see how that sort of pans out because it's it's going to be different from that again because the normal or easiest route would probably just to do best part part two i guess but right. we're trying to move around <laughs> a little bit, see what happens. No, but that is interesting because I, when when you say kind of the the song has a very much a, like a, it's it's basically an indie song. That's that's the foundation yeah. of it. So so how do you approach a song like that then to to transform it into what what it is now to give it that that kind of your own your own sauce or, or, or yeah I don't yeah. Know how to... <laughs> no, no, I, I, it's hard to sort of explain that because there's a lot of really good indie songs that doesn't really translate either. Right. So because so, you lose something in translation, which is kind of like remixing or remaking or reworking something or mm-hmm. working with a different. It, it's really, really difficult. Uh, but I think for best part and some of the other songs we're working with in the end, it it has a lot to do with how they structure thing, how they sing mm-hmm. things, how they write the songs. That kind of translates into what we do so when we start adding like these more analog electronic sounds to it it still translates and to me it's like any as if a song is really good you could just play it on a guitar right and then it could be anything so mm. i think it really comes down to their songwriting and and how we work together uh, to create these things it's just sort of a match made in heaven maybe is is that the same then uh, when it came to gratitude? Uh, if, when you work with with people like Above and Beyond, it, it, does that kind of the reason why a song does well is that because the people who are involved click uh, well together, or because I can imagine yeah. I I'm, I'm not sure, but I can imagine that within the EDM kind of music scene, a lot of people might work together or try to work together, and then it doesn't work out. So. The, the songs that we do get to hear, are those just, just the successful kind of attempts? Uh, for us, we try to, but I, you know, I don't definitely don't think that's the case. I think okay. a lot of these collaboration is definitely a uh, very sort of uh, strategic uh, okay. collaborations kind of thing. I think that happens a lot and you can kind of tell. Um, as for us, when we met, uh, you know, Marcus has been really good friends with Pavel for for a while Mm. and you know he was in Finland and this is probably years and years ago um and he just like sent me this rough idea and I I remember it because I was driving in my car here in Norway and I heard it and I was like there's something here like something special but this is like mid-COVID and it's not not really much you can do but Mm. there was something there but the really cool thing about above and beyond and i'm juna beats as a whole i guess but specifically above and beyond and pavel and these guys is that i was invited there uh, to his cabin in, in finland where he has a studio and this is actually the first time i meet him in person and okay. it's like meeting like an old friend he, they're <laughs> so down to earth they're super passionate about what they do and, and they have like this strange thing that I, I guess you can relate to that, but sometimes you just meet people where you just make you feel at ease. Mm. It feels like the most natural thing. And that's like who they are. 
So, so, so it was always like super creative about it. And, and when we were there, it was like no pressure. There was like mm. no pressure to write anything, finish anything. It was nothing like that. It was just like, when you feel like it, go in the studio, sit there. There's a piano in, the, in like in the living room. There's a guitar there. There's an incredible studio <laughs> over there. If you feel like it, sleep, eat, sauna, do whatever you want. And if something good comes out of it, great. If not, also mm. great. That's fine. Um, so like that no was the pressure. biggest. Thing. Yeah, there was no pressure because for me, like in my career, I, I've been, you know, I'm writing everything pop to dance music and everything. Mm -hmm. I've been to all of these writing sessions in the states and with like this bigger, bigger, big, big, big label, major labels, and it's like, hey, between ten and twelve, you're sitting in Studio A and you're gonna write the chorus, and that's mm -hmm. what you're gonna do, and it's like finish it. Uh, and so it's like a machine <laughs> and then, like, it doesn't inspire creativity. Right. right. So it, it also kind of transcends the music. It, you hear it in a lot of the pop music, a lot of dance music, hip hop, all of it, it kind of sounds the same. And that's just because that's how they do it. Right. So this was completely refreshing. And Paul and the guys, such brilliant producers, brilliant musicians. And we're just like super happy that they just, let us do our thing really and just let, let us be a part of it so yeah much kudos no no, no i think the song turned out really well and even the remixes oh, uh, of that song those are those different interpretations are very cool to listen to um yeah. when it comes to the future then because i read that you're planning to re release an album in 2023 and what i like about that is um there is a sense of uh because we live in a time where people release singles, right? We have streaming services. There's there's a sense that you have to release something every at least six months so, so people don't forget you. But you, you guys then still love that album concept or, or at least the, the idea of a kind of uh, cohesive whole. So 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 what, what was the mindset in doing that and, and the diversity in terms of the songs as well? Because your latest track is quite different than the, the ones before as well, so... Yeah, uh, well, I think that's the thing, right? Like, because if you could do an album, there's no limitation to what you can do. There's not like, oh, you have to do a single that does this for algorithms or it has to do right. that so you don't forget you. And I think that's, it, it is true. Of course it is true. Like, or else it wouldn't be like that. It, you have to be, it, it is a business after all. But for an album, like we always looked at ourselves as album artists because we are so diverse and you know everything from you know we did the gratitude more open big room kind of thing and then we did like with luna samara's label where it's like an underground techno record and then you know follow up with influence which is like a banging <laughs> right i don't know what it is but it's like really hard and like we're so much more than just gratitude and we're so much more than uh, best part so but we're everything in between and in an album we have the opportunity to be everything in between and we can make a record in 110 bpms if we want to and we can also make one in 135 if that's the, the right thing to do so for us it's more of that and it's also how how we envision our dj sets going to be or our, our right. live sets going to be when we go touring because we want to take people into a theater like that's what it feels like it's going to be different we want people to stand on their toes not like wait for the next drop and then there's a beat and then the next drop and so on and so on we like want people to be a little bit challenged and, and want them to be entertained to tell a story in a way kind of during the yeah. set yeah and i think every song should tell its own story but it's like how you put them together mm. it maybe builds uh yeah it builds a movie i guess with with that in mind, then what 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 are your hopes for Anami? Because you, you've now started with we kind of have the although maybe this is uh, too early, but we kind of have the pandemic in our rearview mir mirror, uh, at least for, for the time being. <laughs> um, so so, what are your thoughts? Is it, is it, is it are are you going to tour a lot uh, as well? Is that the plan? Are you well? Obviously, you're working on an album. What what is kind of the 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 plan? <laughs> for the the plan, the master plan. The master um, plan. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, the, we well obviously it depends. Like it's obviously down to how it's received, how what we can do, and stuff like that. I think for now, I, people been very supportive of it, and it's been well received. We got to play these amazing shows already. Um, you know, we have 
some touring this uh, year. We we weren't planning on doing anything touring wise after okay. Class Outer. Uh, the plan was to sit, make music, and just once we're ready for that. But then opportunities like you know the Gorge, uh, Brooklyn Mirage that mm-hmm. we're doing now in August. Um, when we get these opportunities, you can't really say no because it's something you always wanted to do. And it's also an opportunity for us to showcase what we're working on so people we can right. build that excitement towards it. But the plan is obviously to make make finished album, um, get that out sometime early next year. Uh, and then we want to go on a, on a full proper tour uh, with all the visuals that we're working on, mm-hmm with all the light and everything, because it's going to be a show. It's not just going to be us DJing somewhere. It's going to be a show if we're going to do it. Right. So it's going to expand a lot uh, in the coming months as well. Yeah, I think that that's the plan. Uh, we, we're already investing quite a lot into the visual side of things. Right. Um, and, and, and it's really important to us because we want to give people value for their money um, and, and get them a real show, something to talk about. So that, that's important. So I think, if we can do that, we'll we'll get on the proper tour, uh, and, and we'll figure that out. It looks really interesting. So, sounds good. Yeah. Final que- final question that you mentioned a couple of shows that you have planned and and have already played. One of them was the Gashouders Fabriek in Amsterdam. Uh, mm. Since we're a Dutch uh, company, so I'd like to ask you about your experiences just, just especially after those couple of years that we've had where touring was impossible and just kind of being yeah. back back in in a situation like that and and, and being in Amsterdam what was it like it was you know like it, it's kind of like the church isn't it like it, it's kind of like the techno church of everything like we were like we didn't even know what to expect. We've seen all the videos, obviously, and we always dreamt about going there. And then we got the opportunity to do it. And it was big pressure for us because we all always, obviously, wanted to go there. But we also just started this new project <laughs> and we had a lot of music, but nobody heard any of it. So right. we're like, okay, we're going to play a set full of music that nobody heard. And it's 6,000 people or whatever it is there, four, four or 5,000 people. Um, but it was just amazing. Like it was mm-hmm. incredible. But I think the coolest thing that happened uh, during the whole thing was after the show, last show, we decided to go to an after party uh, that Anjuna Beats had. Uh, I don't remember the club, but downtown. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were like, oh, we're just going to get on the tram. Uh, and we just walked out with everybody else and we didn't even think about it. Uh, and we get on the tram. And the whole tram starts singing the best part once we go into the I, I get goosebumps talking about it. It was like crazy. And I'm like, you know, we were like, maybe we are onto something here, man. <laughs> this is fucking crazy. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was so cool. So cool. Really. Yeah, but Klaus Alder, amazing experience. Can't wait to to do that again sometime. Well, it's awesome to hear, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm glad that the that the people in Amsterdam treated you well. Um, oh yeah, Thomas May, I thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you so much for having me.